Så med det så kan jag önska dig välkommen. Welcome to you Richard. Nice Thank to have you here at Nornet. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Yeah. So just take us through the presentation and we will take the questions uh, when you're finished. Good. Thank yeah. you. So I'd like to introduce Bergen Bio and update those that are already familiar with our company. We are we're entitling the presentation Axle Inhibition to Prolong Life and we're really here to talk about our first-in-class medicines to treat aggressive cancers. As you know, we are listed on the Oslo Exchange and we have the usual disclaimers and I will be making some forward-looking statements, so please pay attention to those. Just by way of summary, as a corporate snapshot, we are the world leaders in understanding what makes cancer aggressive. What we mean by aggressive cancer is cancer that no longer responds to drugs, that's invisible to our immune system and spreads around the body. Different to other biotech companies, we've invested heavily over the last few years to develop a diverse pipeline of both drug candidates and clinical development programs. I'll be spending most of this presentation talking about our lead drug, BGB324. We've already reported some promising efficacy and some safety data from our early clinical trials, and I'll be summarizing that today, and also talking about our companion diagnostics. It's really important with our medicine that we can identify the right patients in the future who will benefit from our drug. We listed on the Oslo Exchange in April of 2017. We raised 400 million kroner, and our market cap currently stands at about a billion kroner. As an organization, we have about 35 staff, split between our headquarters and research facility in Bergen and our clinical development teams in Oxford in the UK. On the top right, you can see a summary of our pipeline, BGB324, a clinical asset in multiple phase two programs, several preclinical antibody programs, a naked antibody and an ADC program that's partnered, and we still have some research projects that are preclinical. What, what I'd like to just discuss in this slide is the real problem with cancer. About 50% of the population will get cancer at some point in their life. But 90% of the cancer deaths are related to aggressive cancer. What Bergen Bio and our scientists have done is discovered this switch in the middle that we've labeled axle. And it's really this switch that cancer uses to become aggressive, meaning it can spread around the body, hide from the immune system, and resist drugs. By inhibiting axle, we can treat aggressive cancers, we can reverse them back to being manageable or treatable cancers, and we can stop the manageable or treatable cancers from becoming aggressive. Axel seems to be the really important mediator of these aggressive cancer traits, and that's what we're targeting with our drugs. What we and others have shown is that aggressive cancers, not surprisingly, correlates with poor overall survival. These are survival plots, and you can see on the left-hand side, it has the probability of survival, and on the right-hand side of each chart, it shows the number of months, and it's the various patients in the red and the green line. Clearly, the patients who have aggressive cancers follow the red trajectory, and they have a worth, worse prognosis than patients with the green line. The patients with the red line are the patients whose tumor expresses axle, who have this axle switch that makes them aggressive. You can see that there are different time frames for different cancers. Lung cancer is relatively short time frame to progression. Breast cancer may be a little bit longer. Leukemia even shorter still. There's a lot of data suggesting that Axel correlates with poor overall survival in almost every cancer you can think of listed on the right hand side. So what is aggressive cancer? Well, I guess the first thing to try and share with you is the idea that cancer, or more specifically a tumor or a lump that's growing out of control in your body, is not just one cell, but it's multiple different cells. The cancer cells, which we've indicated here in this graphic, are star-shaped, and indeed that really is what aggressive cancer cells look like. And they are punctuated by this axle protein that sits on the cell surface. But also in the tumor, there are many, many other tissues and cells as well, 
including blood cells, nerve cells, but most importantly, immune cells. These immune cells also express Axel. And what we can see in this red frame here is that Axel is all over the tumor cells and in the tumor microenvironment, and they stop the, the immune cells, the NK cells, the M2 cells, the T cells, from being able to attach and kill the cancer cells. They also stop the chemo agents that are indicated on the right from working against the cancer. So when the cancer cells have the Axel switch on, they are invisible to the immune system, they can resist therapy, and they can spread around our body. By inhibiting this axle switch with our drugs, specifically BGB324, we can revert the tumor into the green phase. Here you can see the cancer cells are more like bricks. They're big, they're fat, they're solid. They're in growth mode. But when they're in growth mode, they're also visible to the immune system, and they can be seen and attacked by the immune cells, such as the T cells and the NK cells. And these cells, when they're in this phase, are also sensitive to cancer drugs. So by inhibiting this axle switch with our drugs, we make the tumors tractable by the immune system and sensitive to cancer drugs, and therefore stopping them from being aggressive and hopefully prolonging life of the cancer patients. So how many of these patients have aggressive cancer? Well, what we've listed here on this chart is a schedule of many different cancers and the relative proportion of cancers that are aggressive or in other words, rich in axle. You can see that lung cancer may be 90% of patients, whereas CML at the bottom may be 50%. At any moment in time, a large proportion, if not the majority of cancers are aggressive, are rich in axle. That's taught us that we need to be able to identify the patients whose tumor is axle positive, as opposed to those that are axle negative, and target our therapies, our drugs, for those that are axle positive. Therefore, we're developing a companion diagnostic as well as the drug so that later in our clinical development and ultimately when we're on the market, we'll be able to just, just deliver our medicine to the patients who have aggressive cancer or axle mediated cancer and hopefully so a benefit for those patients. We've elected to do our clinical trials in lung cancer, breast cancer, acute myeloid leukemia and melanoma. Those cancers have a, represent a severe unmet medical need. Current drugs really do not work very well for those patients. They're also generally quite rich in axle and also represent a very, very large addressable market. We could equally well target prostate, colon, relung cancer. Uh, they, they equally have a, a, a similar prognosis and represent a very large market. But for the sake of our early clinical discovery phase, we've elected to work in lung, breast, leukemia, and melanoma. Again, just a little bit more confirming the role of Axel both in the immune cells in our tumors and also in the, in the, in the, in the tumor cells, you can see the two panels on the left show the Axel stains in both these, both these cell types. On the right, in the bottom in black and white, you can see how the cancer cells change from being round and brick-like to being star-like to being round and brick-like again. In other words, non-aggressive, they then become aggressive, and blue and red in the middle, and then when you add our drug, they go back to being round and fat and, and uh, epithelial and sensitive to drugs. This is, this is really quite compelling evidence that our drug does what it says it does. It keeps the, the cancer cells and the tumor in a form that can be addressed by other drugs and visible to the immune system. There's a vast body of preclinical data now supporting our clinical strategy. There are basically three different types of cancer drugs that are available to patients. There's the new immune oncology drugs, that work very well in a small proportion of patients. There's the targeted therapies that also work well in a small proportion of patients whose disease is driven by a mutation. And there's the good old fashioned chemo agents that have been around for a long time that may work well, but have dreadful side effects. You can see on the left hand side, the combination of our drug with the immune oncology agents called checkpoint inhibitors. And you can see how in the blue line here on the left hand side, maybe there's a 5 or 10% survival benefit, 
whereas you add our drug, it will increase it to 50%. In the combination setting in the middle panel, this is a lung cancer model. Again, you can see where our drug is added into the, into the tumor. There's absolutely no tumor growth at all. And in combination with, uh, sorry, in, 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 in a single agent in the leukemias, you can see that in actual fact we get tumor shrinkage. So all of this is achieved by taking BGB324. BGB324 is what's known as a small molecule, which means that you can take it orally as a pill just once a day. And all the, all the innovation is in understanding the biology that makes cancer cells aggressive and in designing the small molecule so that it's highly selective for Axel. The compound BGB324 is a very stable compound. We, we, we've already, it already has for a three and a half years shelf life and we've already manufactured more than 25 kilos of the drug. You can see we package it in a simple pot and distribute it to the hospitals to administer the patients who take it home to take just once a day. So it's a very robust molecule with a secure supply chain and manufacturing route. Our strategy going forward based on some of the early data that we've, we've presented is that by inhibiting Axel with BGB324, it's the foundation of therapy into the future. It may find utility as a single agent or monotherapy in some, leuke some leukemias. It certainly has a role to play in combination with chemotherapeutics, and we're demonstrating that in a leukemia study and a lung cancer study. Similarly, it will have a role to play in combination with targeted therapies. We have two studies demonstrating this, another study in lung cancer and one in melanoma. And most definitely, the role of axle inhibition in amplifying the effects of the checkpoint inhibitors will be very important in the future. And we have three studies running in combination with the immune checkpoint inhibitors, one in melanoma, a second in triple negative breast, and a third in lung cancer. Our strategy is to position axle inhibition with BGB324 as the foundation for all chemotherapy for cancer going forward. Our clinical development program at this stage in phase two is quite broad. We will be administering our drug to more than 350 patients at 50 hospitals throughout Europe and North America. And next year, 2018, is a critical year where we'll have initial readouts in May, June time and some final readouts at the end of the year. You can see that we have three studies in lung cancer, one in combination with the checkpoint inhibitor Keytruda, one in combination with the targeted therapy Tarceva, and a third one in combination with the chemo agent docetaxel. I'll talk more about these studies in a moment. We also have a study running in triple negative breast cancer, again in combination with Keytruda. In melanoma, this is a great study in combination with both checkpoint inhibitors and targeted agents. And lastly, in leukemia as a single agent and in combination with chemo. It's a broad program, it's, it's enrolling a lot of patients, and it will certainly show the utility as BGB324 as a cornerstone for cancer therapy going forward. You'll also notice on this slide that we have collaboration with Merck in both a lung cancer study and a breast cancer study. This is a significant validation of our technology. Merck is very intrigued by the biology of Axel and its role in potentiating the benefit of a checkpoint inhibitor. We've now established a collaboration with Merck where they will provide to us the Keytruda drug. We sponsor the trials, we own the data, and at some point we may be able to talk to Merck or other companies about possible further development with their checkpoint inhibitors. A little bit more about this cornerstone strategy for positioning axle inhibitors as the foundation for all cancer therapy in the future. If we think about non-small cell lung cancer as a disease indication, this is a dreadful disease. 75% of patients typically have a life expectancy of less than one year. In part, that's because they present to their doctor very late when it's stage three or stage four metastatic disease. The treatment options to these patients at that stage are probably limited to just three. If they have a particular marker called PDL1, 
they may be suitable for, combat, for, for, for therapy with a checkpoint inhibitor. Keytruda is the market leader. If a particular mutation can be found that drives the disease, they can have a targeted drug such as allotinib to try and stop the driver mutation for the cancer. But the vast majority of patients, 50% or more, actually have no driver mutation and do not have high expression of pd one and they go straight on to chemotherapy. In each case, as I've shown you previously, the chemo, the targeted, and the checkpoint inhibitors all benefit from combination with BGB324 because that keeps the cancer cells in the green, non-aggressive form where the chemo, targeted, or the immune system can work better. We have clinical trials running in combination with each of these different therapy types. We were fortunate enough to be invited to present our corner, cornerstone strategy at the World Lung Cancer Conference in Yokohama, Japan uh, last month. It's quite unusual and again quite significant validation that a company such as ours pioneering a new treatment paradigm is invited to give three presentations at one conference. The study that we're doing with Merck, with Keytruda, was invited just to present the preclinical rationale, the scientific foundation, and the study design. This study only opened in September, I believe. The allotinib study, the combination with BGB324 with the selective uh, uh, targeted uh, drug allotinib against EGFR, we presented some of our early phase 1b data where you can see there was a 50% uh, clinical benefit seen by patients and indeed one patient remains on drug nearly two years later. And the third study that we presented was the combination with docetaxel, the chemo agent, where in actual fact we were able to see several patients had prolonged uh, progression-free survival and one, per one patient even saw some tumor shrinkage or partial remission. Um, again, quite a remarkable result. Uh, Dositaxel is a very toxic drug. Many patients can't tolerate more than two, three, maximum four doses of docetaxel. Some of these patients were able to take 10 or 13 doses of, of docetaxel in combination with our drug and saw a durable response for approaching a year. So since we floated the company at the beginning of the year, at the end of quarter one, We've been very busy with opening a number of trials and pursuing a number of startup milestones, many of which you can see have been checked off in 2017. We will be presenting some data at, uh, regarding our leukemia study uh, at a conference in December known as the Association uh, uh, of uh, as, as, um, can't remember the name, sorry, gone blank, at a, at a leukemia conference in December in, in, in Atlanta. The next most significant milestones to look out for will be the presentation of interim data at the end of quarter two, 2018, and then for some of the trials to, to finish up and, uh, and report out at the end of 2018. Turning our attention to the finances, there's been no significant change in our balance sheet throughout the year with the exception of the IPO and the influx of cash. Our expenditure quarter on quarter has pretty much been in line with budget and forecast. Slight increase uh, in quarter three as we're increasing our clinical research. We close quarter three with nearly 400 million krona on our account and we see our cash runway leading well into 2019. So in summary, Bergen Bayer is developing first-in-class drugs for aggressive cancers with a very large addressable market. We have multiple phase two programs open, recruiting and dosing patients right now. And we anticipate releasing interim data at the ASCO conference in May 2018. As a business, we're well resourced. We've put together an experienced organization and are confident we can deliver our pipeline and milestones. Looking further ahead, we have a clear strategy to develop and commercialize our assets, either together with a partner or, or on our own in, in targeted patient populations. Hopefully that was an interesting summary and update on our business. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Richard. We will now head to some questions. And om der nå sitter nå hjemme og lurer på nu har spørgsmål til Richard, så er det da bare at bruge kontrolpanelet sitt. Skrive ind disse spørgsmål og da under questions så skal jeg læse disse op for ham. Eh, for dere som har kommet lidt senere til sendingen, så som jeg sa indledningsvis, så ligger da denne præsentation nedlastbar under handouts også der i control panel. So we will start off uh, with a few questions that we already received, uh, Richard. Uh, question one, will uh, efficacy for um, AML MDS study be reported at um, ASH? Mm -hmm. So ASH is the conference whose name I couldn't remember a few moments ago, <laughs> the American Society of Hematology. Yeah. So sorry about that, it slipped my mind. Um, we'll be presenting uh, an update on the ongoing trials. Um, there's, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly broad trial using BGB324 as a single agent and in combination with other drugs. We will be reporting some e efficacy data, but uh, ev even more interesting, we'll be reporting the correlation of efficacy with the biomarker. As I said earlier, it's really important that we can identify the patients that benefit or indeed the patients that will not benefit and so that correlation. So yes, some efficacy data and some biomarker data will be presented at ASH. And that was in uh, May? That's in December. Uh, December. That's December, sorry. three sorry. weeks time, yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay, uh, question two. Um, if one can enrich the trials with a companion diagnostic, will these patients mm. be enrolled as a new arm in the studies? Not in these studies. No. Part of what we're doing in these phase two studies is actually collecting an all-comer population. It's just as important to collect patients whose tumor is not driven by axel as it is patients whose tumor is driven by axel so that we can show that the companion diagnostic works. When we have validated the companion diagnostic, we will then seek to enrich the patient populations, but that will be in a separate protocol in different trials. Um, so we would hope that our next round of clinical trials, um, 2019, will be enriched for axle positive patients using our companion diagnostic. Mm. And that leads into question three. Uh, if the phase two trials includes a sufficient number of patients and indicate a clinical benefit, will the company mm. file for accelerated approval with the FDA? Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. <laughs> that, that must be one of our higher objectives. Uh, developing a first-in-class drug, being the first and having compelling data uh, is, is something that the, uh, that, that, that's required to have accelerated approval or indeed the European equivalent is called prime status mm -hmm. and we most definitely have our eyes and our objectives set on that. Um, uh, it, it, will be a, it will be a wonderful thing if our data is sufficient to, to, to apply for accelerated approval definitely. When do you see the company getting some, uh, some uh, revenue streams from, <laughs> from this? Okay. Well, well, I guess revenue can come from two forms. Where we could have some licensing or partnering revenues mm -hmm. if we were to to share the development costs and the potential commercial benefits of the product with, with a partner. Mm -hmm. um, that that would be one form of revenue. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to commercialize the drug ourselves, then that would require completing phase three studies, filing with the regulators, uh, and 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 then starting a marketing activity. I would suggest that commercial revenue from from sale of medicines to patients through a healthcare system would probably not be until 2022 at the earliest. Mm -hmm. um, partnering revenue, of course, could come earlier. Uh, approximately when? I know it's uh, hard to say, but uh, it's, it's it's very hard to say. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, we 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 have high visibility now. I think that's really good. Um, you, you will have observed a constant stream of press releases from the company as we're presenting at different conferences. Mm -hmm. You know, we have multiple lung cancer studies, leukemia, breast cancer, melanoma, and, and maybe some more studies on the way. So we have we have a, a, a lot of attention, a lot of focus, a lot of news flow. Um, we're certainly on the radar of a lot of companies, and we have ongoing discussions with, with many potential partners. Um, at the moment, though, everyone, including Berg and Bio, is focused on, on, on demonstrating the value of axial inhibition in the clinic mm. and, and showing clinical, clinical benefit. Um, I think that uh, 
we, we, when, when that's been demonstrated, I think we'll have a lot of opportunities both to further develop ourselves or indeed to talk to partners about sharing the development costs and, and activities. Uh, we jump to the next question. <clears throat> on the Q, Q3 presentation slides, there are updates on the different trials. Can mm. you elaborate a bit on these results? Mm. Um, and um, a follow up Does these slides display the duration of the mm. PGB324 treatment with efficacy to be reported on later? Um, yes, lots of questions there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we have. We have a lot going on. It's quite difficult to communicate everything in one slide deck. So that's why I've decided just to concentrate on lung cancer as we really cover quite a plethora of, uh, of studies and, and a strong rationale. In the quarter three slides that the listeners will have sight of, we can see that we presented uh, some data on two of our lung cancer studies, both of which showed duration of treatment. But it's probably worth spending a moment uh, explaining that a little bit. Um, in both cases, these patients were what is called relapse and refractory, meaning that they failed all other drug treatments and their disease is progressing. That's the very sick patients who come on to relatively early clinical trials. Um, they, then, they then start taking our drug in combination with another drug that they've already failed on. That's the important thing. So in one of the studies, in combination with allotinib, the targeted therapy for EGFR-positive patients, these patients had already failed on allotinib. Allotinib had stopped working. What we reported here is that half of these patients saw a prolongation of disease stabilization for four months. In other words, the allotinib worked for maybe eight or nine months. It then stopped working, and their tumor started to grow. We then gave our drug and for another four months their tumor stopped growing. One patient even now continues to be taking our drug and their tumor stopped growing and indeed has shrunk a little bit. Um, in the second study that we reported is in combination with docetaxel, the chemo agent. Now again at this stage in patients treatment the expected response rate would be somewhere 10 or 15 percent of patients would see a response and they'd only possibly be able to tolerate two to four doses of docetaxel. You know, it's a dreadful dreadful drug with horrible side effects. It's a really stereotypical chemo agent. Um, um, what, what we saw here was that um, patients were able to tolerate the combination of docetaxel plus our drug very well. Some patients were even able to tolerate this out to what's known as 13 cycles, so 10 or 11 months. Um, and and uh, about 40% of the patients showed a response. Their tumor stopped growing, and one of them, their tumor started to shrink. Now, the industry has a standard for claiming a full remission or a partial remission, and in one of these patients, a partial remission was claimed, which means that the tumor shrank by 25%. So again, if we can imagine these patients that I'm referring to, they failed every other treatment option. As a last-ditch attempt, they've now gone on to, on to, on to uh, a clinical trial, one patient is still benefiting nearly two years later, um, and, and in, the in the case of the patients on, on the chemo, then they saw their tumor shrink for nearly a year. So that was really very, very exciting and compelling data, and exactly what our biology predicted. That's probably the most significant thing here, is that we predicted this because of all the research that the scientists in Bergen have carried out, that by inhibiting Axel, we make the cancer cells visible to the immune system and sensitive to drugs. And that's exactly what we've seen to happen in the portion of patients that we, we, we recognize as being actual positive. The other piece of data that we presented uh, in the quarter three report was from the melanoma study. This, in actual fact, is an investigator-sponsored study being, being managed out of Bergen by Professor Obion Stromer. This is a really neat study. Um, it'll take a few minutes to explain. But there's basically two arms to the study, depending on what's driving the disease. Um, it, it, it's, it's a well-designed clinical trial, and it's attracting a lot of patients. I think there the data cutoff was towards the end of the summer when we submitted the, um, the abstracts to the World Melanoma Congress. And what we can see there was that a number of patients have been taking our drug for 25, 30 weeks, and, and time continues to tick. Again, what we've learned from that study and reported already is that the combination of our drug with double 
targeted therapy has been well tolerated without severe adverse event and also the combination of our drug with Keytruda, the checkpoint inhibitor, has been well tolerated for extended periods of time. So yes, we are reporting duration of treatment as well as safety and some re evidence of response. Sorry, long answer to a short question. Yeah, well, that's nice. Um... Er det ikke noen flere spørsmål som har kommet inn? Da tenker jeg at hvis man lurer på noe nå, så må man bare få skrevet det inn her. Is it... Should we sum it up a bit? Maybe, I think there's one question... For the investors out there, what's the most important data or... For them to look out for the next year or so? Okay, well there's probably just one thing I have to say that sort of on my discussions with, uh, with investors and analysts over the last few days, a, a recurring question has been the question about patient recruitment, mm. recognizing it's quite competitive to get patients and pr prolonged uh, clinical trial timelines could be, could be an investment risk. And what I'd like to say to that is that we have, we have many trials open and running. We've invested heavily in uh, opening trials in Norway the UK, Germany, Spain, Italy, and in North America. So we put down a very large footprint. Regulators are familiar with what we're doing and seem to be quite happy, uh, and, and we don't have any regulatory challenges. But by addressing these multiple jurisdictions and populations, we have access to a lot of patients, and we, we seem to be recruiting patients very well. So I think that's quite reassuring for investors uh, who, who may be concerned that, that it's taken a long time to recruit patients and therefore it could be costing more than, than budgeted. So that's probably one point I just wanted to make and uh, I've, I've often asked that. With regards to the data point in the future, um, as indicated, if I can flick back, yep. um, I think this slide really says it all for, for the investors. I hope that what people have realized that since we floated, we've actually completed all of our prescribed milestones uh, approximately on time during 2017, mobilizing a lot of resources and opening a lot of trials. Of course, we now need to let these trials recruit patients and we need to see the benefit of our drug. Mm -hmm. What we have committed to doing is taking a read of data uh, towards the middle of the year end of the second quarter and submit a number of abstracts to a very large medical congress called ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncologists, which will be at the end of May, beginning of June. That will be the first time when we release data on a significant number of patients in multiple trials. Thereafter, of course, we need to wait for the rest of the patients to recruit and for their benefit to be recorded, and then some of the trials will start to, to complete and we can issue final reports towards the end of 18. Mm. Um, during this period, in the second half of 2018, of course, we will also be firming up our plans for the next phase of clinical development. Um, we have several ideas, but what we really need is the data to, 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 to underpin what clinical development will do thereafters. I think that will be the famous last words for um, Bergen Bio, and uh, thank you, Richard, for uh, coming to Nornet.